You know, they always say that um, it's, it's the captions and the headlines and things like that where, where you need the proofreading. So maybe that the title of my talk may be a tribute to my concern about local issues, but it's not much of a tribute to my, con uh, to my ability as a proofreader. It should be Tennessee's apostrophe S, academic <laughs> freedom. <laughs> and you, you never really see that until you kind of stand back and so. Sorry about that, folks. But um, actually, you're not here for my proofreading abilities anyway. Uh, well, thank you. It's lovely to be back at uh, in, back in Tennessee, and I must say, it is particularly wonderful to be in Tennessee in the springtime. Um, one of the things that I uh, just absolutely adored about living in Lexington, which has you know roughly the same kind of biome as you all here is the dogwoods and the, and the lilacs and the uh, redbud and, you know. This has not been a great trip, by the way, guys. You, you're asking me, you're asking me what, what is my most prestigious award and probably one that's right up there and one that I just am, am terribly delighted to have received is the National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal, which is this really gorgeous thing. And on that, uh, that was a few years ago. But, <laughs> but they lost my luggage on that trip, too. And, so, <laughs> and fortunately, they got it just before I needed to go up before this large group of very eminent scientists. Fortunately, I was not you know, wearing flip-flops and cutoffs. And it was one of the things that, that taught me that when you travel, you know, wear reasonably uh, acceptable clothing because your baggage may be lost and you may be stuck presenting in whatever you were on the plane on. So there you have it. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's been an adventure on this trip and more than one. But uh, I, it's wonderful to be back here. Well, I am here to talk about a tr uh, a, an issue that affects Tennessee science teachers and also teachers from Louisiana, as you will see, because there's some interesting parallels between the Tennessee law and a law that was passed in Louisiana a couple of years ago. But these bills are part of a nationwide movement. So even those of us who are outside of the states of Tennessee and Louisiana are very concerned about what goes on here uh, because we don't really want to see uh, these bills descending elsewhere. <clears throat> now, in the spring of 2012, last year, Senator Bo Watson resubmitted a bill that he had submitted earlier in 2011 that had passed the House but had not yet passed the Senate. This bill called for students to, quote, explore scientific questions, learn about scientific evidence, develop critical thinking skills, and respond appropriately and respectfully to differences of opinion about scientific subjects. Sounds pretty good. Raise your hand if you're against critical thinking in children. You know, you know, of course not. That's quite silly. That This all sounds very good. It also stated that neither the State Board of Education nor any other administrative unit, not a school district or a principal or a board of education could, quote, prohibit any teacher from helping students understand, analyze culture and, sorry, from helping students understand, analyze, critique, and review the strengths and weaknesses of existing scientific theories. Mentioned in the book specifically <clears throat> are the topics of evolution, origin of life, global warming, and human cloning. Well, now, Tennessee teachers haven't exactly complained about being persecuted when they teach these subjects. So it's a little curious as to why the state legislature in Tennessee would feel it, it needed to protect teachers who wanted to critique these subjects. And you know, critical thinking applies obviously across the curriculum and applies across the scientific uh, uh, curriculum as well. So why just these four topics? And who teaches human cloning in high school anyway? You know, I mean, this, this is sort of an odd selection of topics that students are supposed to be especially concerned to exercise their critical thinking facilities on. It happened that when that bill passed last year, scientists, science educators, newspapers in Tennessee vigorously protested this bill and tried to encourage legislators first to vote against it and then encourage the governor to, to veto it. Um, national organizations, um, state organizations here in Tennessee. Why, why, did, why is this innocuous sounding law uh, get the dander of so many scientists and teachers up? get up the dander, whatever. Anyway, people are upset about it. Well, this bill may sound innocuous, uh, but it is detrimental to science education in Tennessee. 
The reason is because bills like this, this bill wasn't just invented in Tennessee. Uh, there have been a number of bills very similar to it over the uh, last couple, uh, last dozen years or so in, in many, many states. And these bills really are just the latest manifestation of our beloved anti-evolutionism, which of course has been a problem in the United States for quite a while and is no uh, new kid on the block when it comes to Tennessee. Uh, certainly the fine state of Tennessee has had its share of squabbles over anti-evolutionism, the most important of which, of which, of course, is the very famous Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. Now probably all of you know very well this, the history of this uh, um, particular episode in, in the state of Tennessee. In 25, the legislature passed the Butler Act, which banned the teaching of evolution. 25-year-old Dayton school teacher John Scopes was approached by civic boosters in Dayton who wanted a test case, a trial that would put Dayton on the map. Uh, the, the, this is such a fun story in so many ways because the motivation for the uh, uh, citizens of Dayton to challenge the Butler Act wasn't necessarily uh, because they felt strongly about the teaching of evolution, but because they thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, introduce people to Dayton and they'd get tourists. Boy, did they get tourists. Things just <laughs> went on from there. Well, the rest is history. Now, clearly the movie Inherit the Wind is, is sort of inspired by the uh, uh, Scopes trial, but it's not a very true um, um, presentation of it. Actually, the, the, the Scope, as good a play as Inherit the Wind and as good a movie as Inherit the Wind turned out to be, the various versions of the movies, um, the actual trial itself was much more exciting. And if you're interested in this, there's a very good book by a guy named Ed Larson called Summer of the Gods, which I would strongly recommend. It's really quite gripping what happened during this trial. In any regard, Scopes lost. The Butler Act stayed on the, um, on the books in the state of Tennessee, and there actually was a couple of other states that passed laws similar to the Butler Act after 1925. And these books basically stayed, uh, these laws stayed on the books until another young teacher challenged a similar anti-evolution law. In a situation reminiscent of that in Tennessee uh, many, many years before, the Arkansas Education Association asked 24-year-old biology teacher Susan Epperson to be a plaintiff in a case to challenge a Butler Act type bill on the books in Arkansas. Now this, book had, this law had been around since the 20s. Why challenge it now? Well, the reason why this bill was challenged in the 1980s is that after a long period of absence, evolution was starting to come back into the curriculum as a result of a number of, of other historical factors, including Sputnik and the need to improve science education and science research in the United States. So um, the new textbooks that were available to teachers in the 1980s included evolution for a change. They hadn't uh, been in the textbooks for a couple decades. And you know there was this anti-evolution bill on the, uh, on the books in Arkansas, and here are these new uh, books that include evolution. What's going to happen? Teachers really need to, we need to get rid of this old silly law is what they felt in order for the teachers to feel comfortable using these new books. So in what was expected to be just a little you know, just a little housekeeping um, uh, issue. The uh, Arkansas Education Association brought suit in the state of Arkansas just to get rid of this dusty old law that had been around since the 1920s. Well, big surprise, <coughs> the um, uh, Chancery Court uh, held for the, the plaintiffs, the, the, any, uh, the Arkansas Education Association, the law was struck down. But then, for reasons that nobody before or since was really quite able to figure out, the state Supreme Court um, overturned it. And so what that meant was that the Arkansas Education Association had a chance to appeal it to the Supreme Court of the United States which actually was extremely lucky because otherwise uh, anti-evolution laws would not have been struck down on a national level. What became Epperson versus Arkansas 1968 struck down anti-evolution laws for all time. And actually from the standpoint of the law, it was a quite simple case. The justices wrote, the First Amendment does not permit the state to require that teaching and learning must be tailored to the principles or prohibitions of any religious sect or dogma. 
Now, the reason for that uh, position is the First Amendment to the Constitution, which has a clause in it uh, about religion, one about free speech, and one about freedom of assembly. The religion clause, just to refresh your memory, says that Congress shall make no law represent shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Establishment of religion, free exercise of religion, when you look at both of those together, makes First Amendment law very interesting, number one, because one person's establishment clause is another person's free exercise uh, case, but nonetheless. Uh, taken together, the establishment and free exercise clause mean that public institutions like schools have to be religiously neutral. They can neither promote religion, which is what the Establishment Clause is all about, nor can they inhibit religion, which is what the Free Exercise Clause is all about. So schools have to be religiously neutral. You can't tell students that they should be good Christians or that they should be good atheists or they should be good people in general, or I guess you could tell them they should be good people, but you know, you, you shouldn't be promoting or denigrating religion in the public schools, and, and actually I think that happens uh, uh, pretty infrequently. The Epperson decision held that the Arkansas law was unconstitutional because it, quote, selects from the body of knowledge a particular segment which proscribes for the sole reason that it is deemed to conflict with a particular religious doctrine. And that is unconstitutional. The anti-evolution laws in Kentucky, in Florida, Arkansas were all struck down, and evolution continued returning to the classroom. Now, creationists had responded to this sort of gradual return of evolution to the classroom, which was sort of creeping up on them through the 70s, actually, as well as the 80s, with the development of what was claimed to be an, a scientific alternative to evolution, and that was something they called creation science. Now, creation science reflects one interpretation of Genesis called special creationism. Now, special creationism is a religious view. It's a theological view that holds that God created essentially as you see in a literal interpretation of Genesis, that God created everything pretty much at one time, the most common version being over six 24-hour days, and that this creation event created the world, the whole universe, the stars and planets, everything, pretty much as we see it today. So creation of everything in the universe in essentially its present form is the essence of special creationism. And clearly this is not compatible with evolution. Uh, evolution sees a gradual unfolding of stars and galaxies and planetary systems and changes in the planet Earth. And in biology, evolution shows the common ancestry of living things. Uh, rather than all creatures having been brought out all kinds in the Bible or varieties of whatever, um, being produced at one time in their present form, evolution holds that there has been a descent with modification, if you will, over time. So special creation and um, evolution simply are not compatible views. Um, and evolution is rejected by creation science proponents because they hold that the Bible is without error and they interpret the Bible literally. The Bible's parts are also closely connected. As this cartoon from the Creation Science Organization Answers in Genesis shows, um, the Bible has to be viewed as a seamless web. He says the six creation days issue in Genesis isn't important to scripture. I'll just take the six days right out of the Bible, and then he is left with nothing. This is a point of view that they hold, that everything in the Bible is based upon creation. Genesis is also viewed as the source of all morality and goodness. Of evolution, because it's not compatible with their interpretation of Genesis, is therefore the source of everything that is bad, as this diagram from uh, Ken Ham's book, The Lie. So this is a very sincere worry that uh, many conservative Christians have, that if their children learn evolution, they will give up their faith, uh, they will not be saved, which is very important, but also they'll be bad people because they won't have this religious foundation to base morals and ethics and, and so forth on. So it's a very strongly held uh, view and it's a very highly motivating view to try to keep evolution out of the schools or denigrate if, if it is being taught. Now, please be aware that 
special creationism and biblical literalism are a point of view, uh, a type of Christian theology that in the United States is um, f fairly common. There's probably about 30 or 40 percent of Americans who hold this point of view. But it is not by any stretch of the imagination uh, typical of Christianity as a whole. Uh, Catholics regularly teach evolution in their parochial schools. Um, so do Anglicans and Episcopalians. Um, there are many um, Lutherans who teach um, uh, evolution in their parochial schools. In fact, I had a, an NCSE member who lived in Texas a number of years ago who told me that he was sending his kid to the Lutheran parochial school so that she would get evolution. Um, not having much confidence in the Texas public schools at that time. So uh, NCSC has a little book called Voices for Evolution that contains statements from a number of religious organizations attesting to the fact that evolution is fine with them. Their theology is something called um, why did that just go out of my brain? I've talked about this for decades and suddenly <laughs> It just slipped out, and I don't think it's the lack of jewelry or deodorant. I, it's just, it's, uh, theistic evolution. There we go. All right. Cuckoo. All right. I, I will now be back in the present. Um, the view of theistic evolution, which is held by Catholics and mainstream Protestants, uh, the majority of Christians, really, internationally, is the point of view that God creates through the process of evolution. So evolution is incorporated into their religious beliefs. It's not, you know, biblical literalism is one Christian view. It is not compatible with evolution, but it is not the only Christian view. And it, uh, there are many views that are compatible. But what the special creationists, um, uh, the Christian and Islamic creationists both, who interpret the Bible and the Quran literally, they reject uh, common ancestry, and their view is that the history of organisms on the planet is more like that of a lawn than a tree. Evolutionists see trees. Okay, you have a branching and splitting uh, genealogical relationship of, of groups through time. Um, creationists see lawns. You have separate special creation, and then you can have variation within the kind and evolution within the kind, but the kinds don't come together. You don't have this descent kind of idea that you have uh, that is typical science. So um, creation science is, is very much um, uh, not accepting of evolution. Um, the kinds of creatures were created at the same time. So therefore, according to creationist literature, humans coexisted with dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. And a great deal of um, creation science is dedicated to trying to show evidence that humans and dinosaurs coexisted. Uh, they they uh, claim to have evidence, say, down in Texas, where human and dinosaur footprints are found together in the same Cretaceous strata. Uh, that's an interesting topic to look at. It's, the evidence for that is not very good, but you know, it's very important for them to try to find evidence that humans and dinosaurs coexisted because that would show that, uh, that, that they feel would disprove evolution. Another thing that they uh, do is they look at things like rock paintings. Um, and uh, you know, do you have any, any kind of view as to what that particular rock painting might, might be? Well, you, you clearly don't have enough imagination. It is, it's a dinosaur with very good posture. <laughs> so, you know, the science of creation science isn't very good, I'm sorry to say, for my friends among the creation science. Uh, when scientists have looked at the claims, the scientific claims, I mean, the religious claims, fine. That's, we have freedom of religion. Believe whatever you want. Go for it. But if you're going to claim that you can show that everything in the universe appeared suddenly in its present form, and you can do this scientifically, we got to talk. Uh, and when you look at the science of creation science, it's a bit, um, it's a bit uh, uh, deficient. What do you do with the observation that light is just reaching us from stars billions of years away if the universe is only six or 10,000 years old? There are things that you have to explain in science. And as an example of creation science, Russell Humphreys has written a book called Starlight and Time, in which he tries to deal with the, the starlight problem. Now, if the universe is young, light can't be reaching us from galaxies billions of years 
a way, how do you do, deal with this? There have been a number of hypotheses from the creationists about how to explain this, such as uh, light is actually slowing down, and it used to be a lot faster in the past, and it's just getting to us now. You know, physicists would have a problem with that. Um, Humphreys um, has a, a kind of a creative uh, approach to this. His view is that the universe is actually very, very ancient, but Earth and living things and human beings, they were created very, very recently. He says that there is a gravitational well around Earth that slows time down around just us, while time is still billions of years outside of our local area. Physicists would probably have a problem with that as well. <laughs> Russell has a somewhat idiosyncratic view of the structure of the universe, because um, he's, he's trying very hard to make cosmology match a literal interpretation of Genesis. Now, Genesis, if you read it literally, says the Earth is the center of the universe. God created Earth and the creatures on it to worship him, and this is the most important thing ever. Now, astronomy tells us that Earth is a fairly obscure planet on the edge of one arm of a not terribly impressive galaxy among literally billions of galaxies. So it's kind of hard to see that everything revolves around us, necessarily, if you kind of look at the big picture here. Um, Genesis says that the Earth is the center of the universe because the people who wrote down the stories of Genesis year, thousands of years ago were geocentrists. They thought that the planets went around the Earth, the sun, if they knew about planets, the sun and the you know the, the sun rises and goes around the earth, right? That's what it looks like when you you know don't don't know um, uh, a different perspective. The other thing that Humphrey says, which is even more bizarre, is that the universe is a sphere, and it's covered in water. This is a really lot of water, you know. Uh, and the reason why he has to have the water is because again he's trying. It's this Procrustean bed of trying to cram everything in modern science into a literal interpretation of Genesis. Uh, by the way, Christian theologians just go nuts about stuff like this. They hate it. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, th this is very important for the particular theology and worldview of the uh, creation science proponents. In the Bible, it talks about the water from Noah's flood uh, coming from the water above the firmament. You know, the rain came through the windows of heaven, the water above the firmament, 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And then you had water from below the firmament. What the heck's the firmament? Well, the firmament is a dome that covers the earth. Humphreys has expanded this. So he's got basically this, the firmament, the waters above the firmament. This dome encompasses the entire universe, all of the billions of galaxies. Problem with this is that you got some real real difficulties here if that water on the outside of the universe is going to get all the way to Earth in time for Noah's flood. I mean, you know, as science, this stuff is not useful. It doesn't really help us understand nature and actually ends up confusing the issue more than anything else. Um, on the other hand, if you're going to have, if you're going to keep the Earth young, you've got to have Noah's flood be literally true. You have to have the water to travel 14 billion miles in order to rain on Noah. The quality of science is not so good. Scientists have, by the way, examined these claims of the creation science proponents and have never found one of them that holds water. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> but the science of creation science isn't very good, but the logic is worse in one sense. Um, you'll find in the creation science literature what they call the two-model approach. And they believe that there's only two possibilities. There's either biblical special creationism or there's evolution. And if you just disprove evolution, well, what's left? All you have to do is disprove evolution and you have therefore left. <laughs> You're laughing. It's silly. I agree with you. This is not very good logic. Okay. Um, Disproving evolution, they say, proves biblical special creationism. Well, that would be true if there were only two possibilities. If not A, then B. That's you know logically uh, uh, fit. The trouble is the premises are all wrong. And the premises are wrong because over there on that biblical special creationism part, there's other options, such as theistic evolution. If you disprove evolution, you haven't proven theistic evolution any more than you've proven biblical special creationism. In fact, you can't prove both of them at once. You're going to have to decide. But why just stick with Christianity? There's a whole lot of other religions around. There's lots of world religions. There are religions that nobody practices anymore, like the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. 
There's tribal religions around the world. Um, there's a lot of, of creation beliefs out there among human beings that disproving evolution isn't going to prove. Okay, so the logic here is is of, of evidence against evolution as evidence for creationism is just very poor logic. The, the premises simply do not uh, follow something like this. Now, I'm going to ask you to keep this in mind because we're going to come back to this evidence against evolution approach because it's very relevant to the issue of the legal um, uh, bills that we're talking about today. Okay, so. In the 1970s and the 1980s, there were a number of efforts to try to get creation science taught in local school districts, and also to try to get state laws requiring the teaching of creation science passed. At least 26 states had such legislation introduced, but only Arkansas and Louisiana passed them. They were challenged in court as being in violation of the Establishment Clause, and the Louisiana case went all the way to the Supreme Court where Louisiana biology teacher Don Aguilard was the lead plaintiff in a case that became known as Edwards versus Aguilard. Now, the Louisiana bill presented creation science as an alternative science. So you have ev evolution science and creation science, and you teach them both, and the students will have a really great educational experience because it'll, you know, it's good pedagogy was the argument. Now, remember when we talked about the First Amendment and how schools have to be religiously neutral. So if you're going to teach a religious view, like creationism in the schools, you have to have a secular reason for doing so. Claiming that creation science was an actual science was the secular reason that was claimed for justifying the teaching of creation science in the public schools, to balance out evolution. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't buy it. Uh, it struck down the Louisiana Equal Time Law on the grounds that creationism was religion and calling it science doesn't make it so. And the advocacy of creation science in the classroom did violate the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause. Well, creationists had struck out again. They couldn't ban evolution and they were unable to teach creation science to balance it out. Uh, but there was hope in some loopholes in the Edwards decision that at least in the minds of the creationists, might allow them to continue their legal uh, perspective. Now, Justice Brennan had written that teachers already possess a flexibility to supplant the present science curriculum with a presentation of theories besides evolution about the origin of life. Now, creation science was the original alternative to evolution, right? But the court had ruled against it. Fairly quickly, a new scientific alternative to evolution was found, and this is intelligent design. Uh, I wish we had more time to talk about the content of intelligent design. It's a subject that is near and dear to me and a very interesting one, but there's only so much that you can do in a one-hour lecture, and obviously we want to leave time for other things. But um, suffice to say that for our purposes today, um, Intelligent design is a subset of creation science uh, that avoids a lot of the uh, fact claims that creation science makes about the age of the Earth and of Noah's flood and things like that. You won't find any of that in intelligent design. But it does focus on the improbability of, um, of really, really complicated things in biology or astronomy occurring without intelligent cause. That's a very convoluted way of saying special creation, quite frankly. Uh, whenever you see something that is irreducibly complex in the language of intelligent design, that is where God has stepped in and poofed it into existence. So it's a very um, um, highfalutin, as it were, type of, of special creation, but it is a type of special creation, just avoiding a lot of the um, uh, really, really, really bad science that you find in creation science. Now, uh, indeed, um, scientists have examined intelligent design as well as creation science, and there's quite a literature critiquing intelligent design and creation science. Um, there's a number of books uh, here on our website, and you can Google intelligent design critiques and find uh, lots of opportunities for that. Now, intelligent design did have its day in court, just as creation science did. The small community of Dover, Pennsylvania, uh, in 2005, somehow my mouse seat seems to be getting lost, um, had a situation where the school board had required the teaching of intelligent design in the uh, Dover, P 
Pennsylvania School District, and a number of parents were not very happy about this. Uh, just very briefly, the school board voted in intelligent design. A group of parents sued. Uh, there was a long trial, and the judge, federal district court judge, decided that intelligent design was not science. It was merely a religious view in disguise, and that its teaching was unconstitutional. Creationists struck out again. They couldn't ban evolution. They couldn't balance it with creation science. And they couldn't balance it with intelligent design either. Well, what's left? There was another loophole. Remember Edwards versus Aguilard, the uh, decision that struck down creation science? <clears throat> Justice Scalia had written in his dissent that the people of, of Louisiana, including those who are Christian fundamentalists, are quite entitled as a secular matter to have whatever scientific evidence there may be against evolution presented in their schools, just as Mr. Scopes was entitled to present whatever scientific evidence there was for it. So evidence against evolution became the new rallying cry for the creation science and, um, to some degree, intelligent design movement. Immediately after the Edwards decision, the creation science proponents folks at the Institute for Creation Research immediately seized upon the uh, evidence against evolution argument. Teachers should be encouraged to teach the scientific evidences and arguments against evolution in their classes, not just arguments against some proposed mechanism, but against evolution per se, against common ancestry even if they don't wish to recognize these as evidences and arguments for creation. Evidence against evolution is evidence for creationism. Where have we heard this before? This is the good old beloved two model approach. Disprove evolution and special creation wins by default. Now, the courts have said you can't teach creationism, you can't teach something like intelligent design that clearly uh, has an agent involved, there's a designer, and that designer is obviously God. It's not some biochemist visiting here from Alpha Centauri. So, you know, what are you going to do if you want to fight against getting evolution taught in the classes? Well, one way that you could approach this issue is to try to denigrate evolution. If you're stuck with teaching evolution, at least have teachers teach it like it's crummy science. And that's what the evidence against evolution approach is all about. Is evidence against evolution really evidence for creationism? Well, obviously not from a logical standpoint, but an awful lot of people think dichotomously like this. And in fact, a lot of students, I suspect, also have this kind of dichotomous point of view. A number, shortly after the uh, Dover decision in late 2005, uh, NCSE was involved in a little case down in El Tejon, California, where a teacher was teaching intelligent design. Uh, actually, it turned out to be young earth creationism, but never mind. But basically, she was teaching the evidence against evolution, right? And a, uh, this became a, a, a bit of a news story. And a reporter from um, CNN came out to interview some of the kids. And the dialogue, I think, is kind of interesting. The reporter says, what have you learned? And the student says, I've learned that evolution has become over the years more and more, more and more people decide it's not completely true and that there has to be another belief or something that replaces it. And what is this? That is an intelligent designer. Meaning God? Yes, God, the Christian God who created Earth in six days. Okay. Evidence against evolution is viewed by creationists as being evidence for creationism and they, they may be reflecting something that's broader in the culture. Let's summarize what we've done so far. Creation science begat intelligent design, which after the Edwards versus Aguilar decision, movement went in two directions. One direction was toward evidence against evolution. The other direction was toward alternative theories. OK, you with me so far? Um, OK. so. Do we have anybody from the biology department here, or chemistry, or uh, not biology, uh, excuse me, biology, or geology, or astronomy department? Anybody here? OK, if somebody were to come to you and say, can I have the list of evidence against evolution? Can you reach into your, your, your desk and pull it out and hand it to them? You look dubious. <laughs> I think you're, if you go to the science departments and you say, what is the evidence against evolution? They're going to say, 
Huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, we don't know evidence against evolution. We, we, understand, we don't understand what you're talking about. If you go to the proponents of this view and of the academic freedom acts that are based upon this view and say, what is the evidence against evolution? You'll be directed very quickly back to the intelligent design and creation science literature. Similarly, if you, I'm, I, top of the diagram. Similarly, if you ask, order, order doesn't matter. <laughs> if you ask the science departments, what are the alternative scientific theories to evolution? You will find the same sort of quizzical look. We don't, when it comes to science, common ancestry is the only game in town. When it comes to science, that the universe has had a history is the only game in town. Evolution is the only game in town when it comes to science. There aren't alternative scientific histories. But again, if you ask the proponents of these views, what are the alternative um, uh, theories, you get directed back to creation science intelligent design. Now, there have been a series of bills based upon this evidence against evolution principle since about 2004. Loosely, they are described as academic freedom acts based upon the first academic freedom act that was passed, or that was pre uh, presented, I should say, proposed in 2004 in Alabama. Uh, this was a bill that teachers to teach alternative theories. And uh, the proposer, the sponsor of the bill, actually admitted up front that this was a way to get creationism into the school. He said, the bill will, layer, will level the playing field because it allows a teacher to bring forward the biblical creation story of humankind. He was just, you know, loose lips sink ships. He was just right out in front about, you know, the, this, the reason for my proposing this bill is to get creationism into the classroom. Uh, the bill got out of committee, but it didn't get passed. But one of the kind of interesting things about this original Alabama bill is that it had a protective provision that um, stated that basically if a teacher were to teach the alternative theories that the teacher could not be um, uh, punished or disciplined or told not to do it, uh, which is kind of a curious thing. My particular hypothesis about why these protective clauses show up in these academic freedom acts is that during the 2000s and 1990s, there were a couple of three cases where individual teachers were teaching creationism, their districts told them to stop it, and the teachers sued the district for their right to teach these views. And of course, in every case, the court says, no, school has to be religiously neutral. You can't teach a religious view to the kids in a class because it's a violation of the Establishment Clause. So stop it. And also, uh, the, the point was also made in these cases that if you sign a contract in a district, you have agreed to, sign, to teach that district's curriculum. You can't just freelance and teach any old thing you want. And if your district says, teach A, not B, <laughs> don't teach B, you have to do what your district tells you to do. A K-12 teacher does not have the kind of academic freedom that a college professor has. And there's a good reason for that. You want to have some continuity from class, you know, fourth grade class to fourth grade class across the district. You don't want kids being prepared in different ways for fifth grade. So there's a very good reason why there is less academic freedom uh, in terms of content. And they, at a K-12 level than there is at the university level. We're not just being mean to, to, to teachers here. But the academic freedom bills, many of them have this protective provision there, which I think is a way to get around these kinds of cases, um, uh, Levesque, Re Webster, and Pelosa, uh, where teachers did try to kind of go off the reservation. They, were, they got their knuckles wrapped pretty hard. Um, there are, unfortunately, a fairly substantial number, polls vary, but at least 15 to 25 percent um, of teachers who would love to teach creationism in their science class. Um, those teachers would be, quote, freed, shall we say, by bills like the uh, Academic Freedom Acts that um, um, protect teachers from uh, violating the First Amendment, or at least that's what they think. I would not like to be the test case for that if I were a teacher. All right, up until this spring, the only academic freedom bill that had passed was the Louisiana Academic Freedom, which was later named the Louisiana Science Education Act. It was passed in 2008. And there have been dozens of other efforts to get bills like this passed. 
There are many similarities between the Louisiana bill and the Tennessee bill. Both of these bills bundle evolution, origin of life, global warming, and cloning. Both of these bills are couched in terms of critical thinking, the pedagogical value of teaching uh, students these uh, various points of view. Um, both encourage teachers to critique evolution and other subjects. Both have an obligatory statement that they're not intended to promote religion. They're you know, ducking the First Amendment. The Tennessee bill, in addition, is protective. Again, brought in from this um, uh, strain of academic freedom bills, shall we say, uh, descended from the Alabama bill. So we're see seeing something of a national movement to pass this kind of bill. Let me just summarize what these academic freedom acts are uh, like. First of all, they don't mention religion at all if they can possibly avoid it. Uh, they don't mention creationism. They don't mention intelligent design. Nothing here but us, you know, no nothing here but us teachers trying to improve the pedagogy of our, of our students. They stress the free speech of teachers and academic freedom of teachers to teach what they consider to be good science and the academic freedom of students to, um, to, to respond in a way that is different perhaps from the curriculum. That's the kind of thing that gives a lot of teachers the heebie-jeebies too because they don't want kids you know, handing in papers uh, sort of going off um, on tangents about creationism or some other um, form of denialism when what the kids are supposed to be doing is learning the content of the, uh, of the subject matter. <clears throat> they are protective bills, many of them, um, protecting teachers if they teach alternatives to evolution or evidence against evolution. And they tend to be permissive, which is more of a legal issue than anything else. Rather than saying, like the Dover Bill did and the uh, um, Arkansas legislation and Louisiana legislation did, rather than saying, teacher, you have to do this, it says, teachers may do this. Now, what that means is that some teachers might and some teachers might not. And it's very difficult to go to a judge and say, judge, this is a bad law. It's going to cause harm. Please, you know, give us an injunction. Let us have a trial and, you know, talk. Most judges would say, well, you know, it's permissive. Let's just see how it works out. And if bad things happen, then you can bring a case, which means you have to find the teacher who is stepping over the line. You have to find a plaintiff who both has standing in a legal sense and is willing. You know, a lot of people are not really willing to kind of stick their necks off, out and become plaintiffs in these kinds of legal cases. It, it takes a lot out of you. And so that, that raises the bar considerably when it comes to uh, challenging these kinds of laws. So the fact that these laws are permissive was, was definitely a, um, a choice in the matter. So what can you do about it? Uh, well, the National Center for Science Education has been helping scientists and teachers, parents, other citizens, deal with attacks on evolution for decades now. And we've learned a lot about how to be effective in keeping the good science in and keeping the bad stuff out. Recall that the bill requires teaching the strengths and weaknesses of evolution, origin of life, global warming, and human cloning. You can probably dispense with human cloning. You know. The human cloning lab will be next Tuesday, right? <laughs> this isn't a big issue. Um, but how could you teach this? You know, if you were in a district, and unfortunately your uh, superintendent or your board of education says, we want you to teach the strengths and weaknesses of these uh, three subjects that are actually in your curriculum, um, what would you do? I mean, what is, the, what is the professionally responsible thing to do? Well, first of all, you have to kind of understand where these folks are coming from. And uh, part of, the, there is a miscommunication going on, and unfortunately it's from the, the people who present these kinds of bills. They, they don't really understand science as well. Let me give you a little idea about the content of science um, as scientists look at it. Science can be visualized as consisting of three concentric circles, the content of science. They are the core idea of science. These are ideas that have been tested very, very thoroughly. They form the foundation for all other scientific knowledge. They suggest new hypotheses. They are fruitful in the sense that we talk about um, fruitfulness of science. And these are ideas that are just so solid. They've been tested for so long and so thoroughly that we're not really arguing about them anymore. 
you know, heliocentrism is probably here to stay. We're not likely to find a whole lot more evidence that would make us question whether the planets go around the sun. Heliocentrism, I think we would all admit, is a core idea of science. Thermodynamics, yeah, they got some good ideas there too. We'll probably stick with them as well. Um, I will argue that evolution, the idea that living things have common ancestors, that the universe has had a history, the past is different from the present, there has been cumulative change, all those things, that is also a core idea of science, that you would find very few scientists arguing about that very basic thing. Where the really fun stuff is in science is the frontier areas of science. This is what the University of Kentucky scientists are working on now, and the scientists at other universities and in business and industry. The frontier ideas of science are the testing of the hypotheses. How are we better explaining the natural world? What are the, what are the things that work? What are the things that don't work? Uh, we'll test them. If they work, we'll, we'll accept them provisionally. If they don't work, eh, throw them away. Um, the good stuff can go into the core if you're really lucky. Most of the time, the stuff we come up with doesn't work. That's the little sad, sad secret of science. We have more ideas than we have good ideas, but nonetheless. Um, and then around the, uh, the final uh, circumference here, the final concentric cir circle, are the fringe ideas of science. These are the ideas that scientists really aren't paying any attention to, mostly because they contradict some core principle. You know, if you go on the internet and you Google free energy, you will have lots of investment opportunities. Okay. These are wonderful machines that you can invest in that will allow us to generate more energy than we put into them, which will solve all of our carbon problems. It will solve all of our energy problems. There's nothing but good times ahead. Send your money here. You know, physicists never invest in companies <laughs> like that. <laughs> Because perpetual motion machines, which is what these gadgets are, violate the core principles of thermodynamics. So the fringe ideas of science, of science are ideas that people might be really excited about, and you can find a whole lot of them on the internet, goodness knows. But if they're violating a core idea of science, you probably should kind of stand back and not take them terribly seriously. Now, occasionally, occasionally, a fringe idea becomes a frontier idea, is tested, and becomes a core idea, but not very often, all right? The classic example is um, uh, 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 continental drift, uh, seafloor spreading. Um, continental drift was a fringe theory, uh, but with the, with the understanding of seafloor spreading and how you know, this, this phenomenon could really slide the, the crust around. Continental drift became a more believable possibility, and it became a frontier science, and now it's a core science. You'd, you'd be hard-pressed to find any geologist disagreeing with the, the idea that the continents change their positions on the surface of the planet. But not very often. Mostly fringe ideas stay out there because they're fringe, and they don't really have as much to do. So where is evolution in all this? Evolution is a three-part idea. There's the big idea of evolution, which is that living things have common ancestry. There's been a descent with modification. There's been this lovely genealogical, uh, genetically related tree of life, shall we say. We study it, th this big idea by looking at the processes of evolution, the mechanisms that bring evolution about. Obviously, natural selection is very important in this, but there are other factors that influence evolution including uh, non-selective changes and all kinds of wonderful new science that is coming up looking at the developmental biology and how that affects things like body plans and so forth and so on. The mechanisms of evolution uh, and also the, the patterns of evolution. The big idea of the pattern and process is basically what encompasses the modern idea of evolution as it's taught by evolutionary biologists today. Now, if we were to sort of superimpose this on the, that idea of the uh, concentric circles, common ancestry is, the core idea, is a core idea of science. The pattern and process, those are frontier ideas of science, okay? The pattern and process kinds of things are where scientists are debating 
uh, various aspects of, of uh, the details of evolution, if you will. Think of the pattern and process as the details as opposed to the big idea, which is kind of the, the central core. And it turns out to be the central core of biology for all of that. Um, big argument for many, many years, pretty much resolved now. Um, are dinosaurs um, uh, the ancestors of birds? Or are birds descended from creatures that were common ancestor of dinosaurs on one end and birds on another. Um, fine, a fine frontier type of argument. Um, are dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded? Are Neanderthals part of the human lineage or are they a side branch? There are a lot of these issues that scientists debate and fight about because scientists fight about stuff. That's what science is all about. It's all about arguing about things. Uh, and that's what goes on in the frontier. And that's the pattern and process kinds of things. And then, of course, we have, you know, there's plenty of fringe ideas in evolution a, a, as well. If you're an anthropologist, you've probably run into the aquatic ape theory, which is, you know, uh, anyway. Um, or, um, or, more broadly, um, there's a Canadian, um, not too sure what his field actually was, but he's, described himself as a philosopher. His name is Rael, R-A-E-L. And the Raelian movement is a real wonderful evolutionary fringe movement. Raelians believe that um, incredibly intelligent people from some unknown planetary system very, very distant from here have actually come to Earth billions of years ago and have been sort of tinkering with the first cell and, you know, plugging things in and, and, and just guiding all of the evolution of the uh, creatures on the planet, of course, including ourselves. Um, that violates some pretty basic, basic principles of science, so uh, most scientists are not spending a whole lot of time on the Raelian theory. Um, the takeaway here is that creationists believe that a weakness of evolution is that scientists are debating these frontier issues, okay? You're dealing with a somewhat absolutist mindset. You're dealing with an, a mindset that looks at the literal truth of a, of a sacred document, okay? And so when you see scientists arguing about something, well, that means that it can't possibly be true. When was the last time you heard a scientist say the word true? Okay. So what's happening here is, is a real confusion in that they are looking at normal debates among scientists about the details, about the pattern and process of evolution, and claiming that those are evidence against the core idea of common ancestry. This is, among other things, a category error. They're really not thinking about how science works in a very, in, in, in a very accurate way. And it's pretty much the same thing with global warming. I know you had global warming last year, but NCSE is also dealing with global warming denialism, and so I had to toss this in, and it's part of your bill. For global warming, the big ideas are two things. The planet has been warming, and humans are largely responsible for the current rate change, which has just taken off. Now, the details of these ideas are what scientists are debating. They are not weaknesses, okay? They are not weaknesses that scientists are debating these issues. Things like um, uh, how much will the ocean rise by 2100? Will it rise two feet or will it rise six feet? Um, what is the role of aerosols in cooling? Uh, what is the role of uh, oceanic, what are, what are the roles of oceans as a heat sink? And um, how much heating is due to humans? Those are all legitimate questions that scientists are debating now. Hint, if you get leaned on to teach the weaknesses of evolution, teach these. Don't teach that global warming or evolution has weaknesses. Teach the actual legitimate debates that are going on among scientists. You will be, you will be following the letter, if not the spirit, of the law, <laughs> which is an interesting way of thinking about it. Um, uh, by the way, um, the second, uh, the idea of the anthropogenic nature of global warming. The humans are primarily responsible for the big, you know, boost that we've had since the Industrial Revolution. That is the more controversial of the two, although you can still find plenty of people denying that the planet is getting warmer, although that's harder and harder as time goes on. 
If you need to deal with the second, the anthropogenic argument, there is some wonderful resources that you can uh, look at to describe the human fingerprint, so to speak. Why is it that we look at the data as suggesting that humans are largely responsible for this current uptick? And there are many resources that you can find on, uh, on the web to, to discuss this. So if we're going to take global warming and uh, plop it on that same three concentric circles, um, the core ideas are that the planet's getting warmer, and the rate of change is largely the result of human activity. And then the details, such as how much is the sea going to rise, um, and there's other kinds of examples that I gave you. Those are the frontier ideas. And these are the kinds of things that you can encourage the students to debate, because those are legitimate scientific issues. How much better to have students debating things that scientists are actually considering still in contention, rather than debating core issues that scientists aren't arguing about anymore, and which students are simply being misled to be taught that these are issues in contention. And then, of course, there are also fringe issues as well. Uh, but the fringe issues of global warming are, are not really worth spending any time on, frankly, and probably you can, you can avoid them. Now, what global warming contrarians and the people behind academic freedom bills want us to do is deny the core ideas of science, attack the frontier ideas of science, and elevate the fringe to dignity in the classroom. What the creationists want us to do is deny the core issue of common ancestry of evolution, attack the frontier areas of legitimate science, and elevate the fringe, in this case creationism, to the position of the classroom. In any case, it's bad science. Um, you can find a lot of resources on these topics if you go to our climate section of our website. Also, um, two sites where you can find a lot of science that refutes creationist arguments or global warming contrarian arguments are talkorigins.org, which is actually almost a legacy site by now because it's so antiquated. But there's so much good information on it anyway. It's still worth going to. And skepticalscience.com. There is also a skepticalscience.org. This is the this is the fault of not getting both domain names when you get a domain <laughs> name. Uh, skepticalscience.org has a different orientation. This is the good one. Uh, this this is a really good site that has uh, has the top 100 uh, climate change denialist arguments. So it would be very worthwhile for you to take a look at. Okay, what can you do? First of all, teach real science. Don't teach the weaknesses which means attacking the core ideas of science that the proponents of these bills want you to teach. The weaknesses are the denier arguments from creationists or anti-global warming ideologues. They lack scientific validity. They don't have a place in your classroom. If you want to do critical thinking exercises, have the students evaluate the details, not the core ideas of evolution or climate change. Second, monitor what's going on in the classroom. Do administrators want you to use creationist or global warming denier materials? Are you not sure whether they're legitimate or not? This is where we can help you. Um, we're pretty familiar with the literature in, in both of these uh, controversies. So uh, I'll give you my contact information, that of my staff. If you are, are told to use some material and it looks a little sketchy to you, if you get some material from a parent, we can, we can help you evaluate as to whether it is, um, whether it is good science. You, you have to decide whether it's, whether it's appropriate for the classroom in terms of pedagogy and level and all that. But we can tell you whether it's good science. Um, <clears throat> do administrators, <clears throat> excuse me. Third, you can encourage your colleagues, uh, or discourage your colleagues, I should say, from using the law to miseducate students. Um, and fourth. One thing I will encourage you to do is to encourage your local school district to pass a model resolution that we will be circulating in Tennessee, which we believe may help teachers a lot. The idea is to have a local school board pass a resolution that clarifies what teachers in that district should do regarding the state law. Because the state law does not give you much guidance. So the local school boards have actually been given a responsibility to um, direct the teachers into how to apply this law. There are ways of applying this law which are better than others. 
The resolution is on our website. I'll give you the URL and so forth and so on. But let me tell you a little bit about what it does and why I would encourage you to take this bill to your local school board and see if you can get your local board to consider passing it or a version of it as they see fit. It clarifies what teachers should be doing. It may well protect the district from lawsuits, which is a good thing. Nobody wants lawsuits. They're expensive. They're distracting. They take money away from kids' education. We don't want to sue anybody. We never want to sue anybody. We don't either because we don't have any money. But nobody wants a lawsuit. So a district shouldn't do stupid things that get them sued. That is, that is a very important point. And from, you know, from the standpoint of, of being a professional teacher, it's what's best for the kids. Okay, so the resolution notes with a whole bunch of whereases that scientists believe that claiming false controversy surrounds the teaching of evolution and global warming, that's not good for students' education. Similarly, science teachers contend that evolution and global warming should not be qualified but presented as scientists view them as sound science. And because the elected representatives, including the governor, have been very unclear as to what teachers are actually supposed to do, whereas, 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 the school board takes responsibility for giving teachers direction. The board tells teachers to reflect the scientific consensus when teaching allegedly controversial ideas. This is a really strong position here. As teachers, it is your job to take the consensus of a science, whether it's biology or history or geology or, or mathematics, you know, whatever you're teaching, uh, English literature, and translate that to an age-appropriate and a uh, context appropriate uh, uh, level for the students in your class. You can't teach everything, obviously, in, in biology or geology uh, or physics or chemistry. Uh, you have to take the consensus view and choose from that what's appropriate for your class. Much less should, be, should you be teaching things that are in the fringe, right? So, you know, teaching the, the consensus view of science is really at the heart of what all teachers do. Crucially, the board is will direct the Department of Education to monitor the situation to be sure that there's accountability to the curriculum. It's a policy that's going to discourage one of your fellow, or a teacher within the district from going off the rails and really endangering the, the, um, the district uh, for a lawsuit. Because if a teacher starts teaching creationism, that definitely leads, um, leaves the district uh, uh, in a position where it could very well be sued, and the district is going to lose because all of the creationist um, uh, lawsuits have been lost by the creationists. The First Amendment is pretty crisp about religious neutrality, and teaching creationism just simply violates the First Amendment. It's a lot better place for the district to be in the position of defending um, the uh, good science than, for a for, than defending a teacher who has uh, violated the Constitution. Finally, the policy directs the district's Department of Education to monitor instructional resources a teacher might bring to teach the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, we've seen in the past that a lot of these books and videos and pamphlets and so forth are always creationist. This is a book that the intelligent design proponents have written specifically for academic freedom laws. And they very, very much want to have um, their book adopted in school districts so that teachers can have balance, right? And we have a, <laughs> a, on our website, we have analyzed the, we, we've written more words than uh, Explore Evolution includes uh, just because the science in it is so wrong that it took us longer to write than, or it, it took us more words to, to refute it than uh, they took to, to present the information. So this is just really, really bad science and sh has no place in your, in your classroom. And your district should not be wasting money on resources that have bad science. So you'll find this policy at the NCSC website. And if you wish to join, hello. Sure glad that wasn't full of water. <laughs> If you are interested in, if you are interested in taking this to your school board, see me afterwards, and I'd be happy to give you one of these very few copies that I brought with me. You can also download it from the website. And actually, if you would like to support the resolution, give me, give me your contact information, and you know we'll see if we can we'll see if you can help. So, would you start this uh, moving around? This is separate from the free book, which is also floating around for for those of you who are going to be teachers. Okay. Now, we would like to see this resolution spread to a number 
of school districts around the, the state of Tennessee. As a way for ensuring that this unfortunately poorly thought out law does minimum damage to science education of Tennessee's children. Now you as teachers are really on the front lines of dealing with this new legislation. The legislation is there, it's not going to be repealed, uh, not at least for a while anyway, according to people I've, who are wise about the politics of the state of Tennessee. But there are ways of interpreting this law that respect the integrity of science and which respect the integrity of the profession of education. And I would encourage you to use some of these uh, suggestions that I have presented today as ways of following the law, if you are directed to do so, but also of doing so in a responsible manner that does not screw up the education of the kids and which also you can do in good conscience. Now you can find more information about evolution, creationism, the global warming controversy at ncse.com. If you uh, go to this button over here where it says News Alerts, you can sign up. We have a free electronic newsletter that comes out every Friday that I think uh, you would find very depressing. It has all kinds of, you know, <laughs> and what's going wrong this week? Um, but it's free. Uh, it, if you go to the news page here, uh, or the climate change page, um, the news page here is, um, uh, has a lot of information to help you, um, you know, see what's going on. You can, you can search for uh, a particular state you're interested in or search for a year. You search, it's a pretty good little search engine there that you can uh, fool around with. And we're a membership organization, so clearly if you can join, that'd be lovely too. Um, NCSE.com. Glenn Branch is the deputy director of NCSE. Robert Lund is our communications director. Peter Hess is our religious community outreach director. Josh Rosenau and Steve Newton are our flare-ups wranglers. Uh, they are people who um, answer the phone when you elect the wrong school board uh, and will help you, give you some good advice. Well, actually, we all do that. We, you know, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's what we do all day long. And our two new climate change specialists, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, education director is Eric Mickle. Didn't mean to forget poor old Eric here. And our two new climate change folks, Mark McCaffrey and Minda Berbeco, are there to answer your questions about climate change and climate change education as well. We are on Facebook, as any good nonprofit is, of course, and we're also on YouTube, where there are lots and lots of fun things that you can see. Here's Steve Gold holding the world's best biological bumper sticker. Is that not the world's best biological bumper sticker? It says honk if you understand punctuated equilibria. So. <laughs> Having had one on my car for several decades, you don't get a lot of honks. But the honks you get are so enthusiastic. People are just so excited. And you know, it's like you'll, you'll pull up at a stop sign and you hear this beep beep and you think, who's that jackass honking as it's lights red? <laughs> and, you know, and you look up in your rearview mirror and somebody's going, uh oh, he understands punctuated equilibrium. You know, the best part about this whole thing is that you watch this in your rearview mirror, right? And the guy is really happy about it. He understands punctuated equilibrium, right? And there's somebody sitting next to him going, <laughs> and honest to God, every time this has happened, the driver's going, just, <laughs> which if you're a biologist is screamingly funny, because that's the way everybody explains <laughs> And that's going on in the rearview mirror. Um, I'm on Facebook, but if you do friend me, please friend me at eugenie.scott, because this is actually where I update. There are many Eugenie Scott Facebook sites, but this is actually the one I use, and that's, that's really me. Uh, I, I mean, it's very nice that people start sites for you, but <laughs> this is, Eugenie.scott is really where the fun stuff happens. All right, I've had a great time in Tennessee, and I, once I get my bags, I'll even be dressed right. You know, that's one thing you learn if you travel a lot. Don't wear your flip-flops and cutoffs. You know, <laughs> travel in something that's reasonably that you can actually appear before an audience without being embarrassed. Thank you so much.